Character writing is a fickle art. It's a balancing act of world building, storytelling, and of course, actual characterization. Across media, there's plenty of good character writing to draw from, like Rainworld Downpour's iterators and the intricacies of their lives, uh, the residents of Snacktooth Island in Bug Snacks, Aziraphale and Crowley in Good Omens, the quest lines in Honkai Star Rail, uh, all the main and side quests of the Magnus Archives, hell, even the earlier seasons of BBC's Merlin. Where there are many good examples, there's also many bad. The latest Warrior Cats arcs come to mind for one, but the p lost potential of those books is too long a discussion to accurately summarise in a video here, and as an avid fan of Warriors, this might be something I need to dissect in a video eventually. All of these, and more, are resources any form of writer can draw from, good and bad, learning where to tread and where to not with your own characters. But there's one medium I haven't brought up yet. One that so readily lends itself to phenomenal character writing. One that I have personally found to house some of the greatest characters in fiction. That is TTRPGs. This is a video about Just Roll With It's Vampire Campaign. This is a video about the second. This video contains spoilers for the Suckening up to episode 5, Bug Snacks, Rainworld's Downpour DLC, Detroit Become Human, Riptide up to around episode 90, and Spirit Spiritfarer. All of these are media I heavily recommend. Please go enjoy them for yourselves first, then return to this video. Vampire the Masquerade as a system lends itself heavily to character writing. With a focus on political intrigue and more socially driven encounters, unlike many other TTRPGs, there's more chance for emotional growth rather than heavy mechanics and combat. This isn't to say that there isn't any of that, but given this is a fiction first TTRPG, like both Candela Obscura, a fiction first horror system, and Blades in the Dark, also fiction first and horror, and some of the inspiration for Candela Obscura, it's easier to throw yourself head first into characterization and storytelling over all else. The Suckening is no exception to this. Even in its starting episode, which is divided fairly evenly into three segments, each dedicated to a player character, these politics are brought up in differing pieces. Uh, a measles sires, pure panic after a measles bites back and is subsequently turned, uh, how Arthur interacts with the vampires of LA, absolutely everything about Shiloh's segment. These moments pave the way for the later episode's conflicts, driven by the inner workings of vampire society. However, none of these conflicts would be interesting without compelling characters. Take a look at Bug Snacks as an example. The mystery of Snacktooth Island and what happened to Lisbeth may be what initially draws your attention, but what keeps it is the characters. You get wrapped up in the lives of the Grumpuses and their conflicts as you're working to advance the plot. Things like the romance between Chandler and Snoppy, the rift between Wampus and Tiffany in their marriage, even Philbo's high praises of Lisbeth that encourage you further to find her. All these things make the story feel more alive and drive you to continue playing. Obviously, in something like Bug Snacks, gameplay also plays a factor. TTRPGs, especially live play shows such as Just Roll With It, sometimes benefit from the mechanics side of things, since a roll of the dice can be exciting, but the fiction first storytelling these shows thrive in means the roleplay takes precedence over this. As a writer and TTRPG enthusiast myself, Watching any media often results in me ravenously dissecting it and its characters to puzzle together why it works so well, or in some cases, why it falls short. In the case of The Suckening, with such phenomenal character writing, there's only one place to start. The beginning. And who better to ask than one of the players? So when I'm making characters for Just Roll With It, I really like to take the situation, kind of turn it on its head, and make a character for that situation. So kind of like a fish out of water scenario, you know, which is pretty clear from Jay being from the Navy on a pirate crew or Vincent being from a completely different world. And now a measle basically just being uh, a newborn vampire. 
For Measle, it started out pretty simply. I think me and Bisley had already talked about being twins, so I kind of took that and made somebody who would kind of be envious of the life that that uh, Shiloh would have lived. You know, like, Measle's disgruntled. He he wants more than what the hand of life has, has given him. And then he finds out that he's the twin to some prince for the vampire world, and he's like, oh, shit, I could have this better life. As far as end goals go, uh, his main goal was to just kind of rise up in power in, in the vampire world, um, be it through just sheer strength or, or his blood. And I guess you'll see how successful he was at that. Character creation, in a nutshell, is a very individualized process for everyone. What Condi just described is only one of the many ways you can go about character creation. Though his method does line up with what is commonly done for characters in fiction to help the audience get a footing in a new world or setting. Uh, for comparison, Percy Jackson does this by having Percy find out he's a half-blood a few chapters into the book and having others explain the world to him. Uh, in Warriors, Rusty gives up his life as a house cat to join one of the clans and through him we learn about clan life. Hell, to draw on the same example I did before, even Bug Snacks does this, having the player take on the role of a journalist who has just arrived on Snacktooth Island. It's an effective way of drawing the viewer in as they learn about the world with this character. Now, I can't speak for any of Grizzly's writing process, because his Twitter DMs are off and he is living unbothered, moisturized, happy, in his lane, focused, flourishing. Or Bisley's, because I would include a response from him here. If I had one! Reply to my DMs, Mr. Channel! But it's clear from their characters alone that they had very different approaches. Whatever their processes, the trio we ended up with balance each other out very nicely, each with their own distinctive goals and perspectives. Because I want this video as a whole to lend some aid and insight to other writers out there, as well as fellow TTRPG players, I'm going to talk a little about my own character creation process, uh, specifically for the novel that I'm working on, and for my NPCs for one of the D&D campaigns that I run. Both of these processes are a little different to me, but at their core are the same. Of course, all advice within this video is from my own experiences, being a writer basically my entire life. While I've done a lot of research, there's still plenty I don't touch on. That being said, for the example of my novel, character creation came after the premise. This is pretty standard of most fiction writers, since it means the resulting characters fit the story you're trying to tell. My novel's premise is fairly simple. Ex-adventurers turned world heroes struggle in the aftermath with the politics of rebuilding a world after war and healing from the trauma of what they went through. Also, it's gay. The two protagonists I came up with explore different themes within this story, which was what I first thought about when creating them. I think this is an important question to ask yourself when making any kind of character. What themes do I want to explore here? The first of the two protagonists in my novel, Nowhere, is a changeling and hero of prophecy. His side of the plot follows his struggles of societal pressures, identity, and grief. The second, Verez, is a fish folk with a drive to be famous. His side of the plot follows the reality of fame, the pressures of religion, and themes of found family. Both of these characters have a lot more to them than this, but narrowing them down into the specific themes and ideas in their initial creation phases helps shape the story, and in turn, develops plot. From here, I think more in depth about personality, speech patterns, and whatnot to decide how they'll behave in each situation I write. As the plot shapes around this, I alter details to fit them more into the world or push the themes I've settled on. For the campaign I mentioned, as I'm the DM, the characters are two of my NPCs. With the players currently aboard a very cursed, may I add, ship called the Selene, the NPCs in question come from a crew of hero pirates who have joined the party's cause. The way this process differs from the one above is slight, but very important. I had to be sure my NPCs were interesting without taking over the spotlight. Running a campaign, of course, means the focus is on the player characters. In this way, a lot of my NPCs become tools to set up moments for the player characters. To give some more direct examples of what I mean, the first of the two NPCs in question is Misery, a tiefling sorcerer. His past directly links to one of my player characters, being a prince, as they both come from the same island and Misery's father is part of the palace guard. 
Misery's familiarity with the island and its politics allowed for my player to have an NPC to talk to about events who completely understood the implications and position he was in. The second is Sarek, a fighter Eladrin. Rather than setting up player character moments, she tied heavily into my world building, with her fleeing from her destroyed home and a very genocidal elven king. She served to help me set up narrative tension and stakes, to then clue the party in further on where the plot was heading and what was currently occurring in the world they're in. Both of these NPCs also serve as some extra muscle in combat to help the players out if it's really needed, but they mostly take a backseat to the players' characters, or serve to also give some insight or information they wouldn't have otherwise. My point here is, even as a player, characters should be created with a purpose in mind. In the case of a measle, he's designed to stick out like a sore thumb amongst vampire society. It's a simple purpose to have him be new to vampire society, but the results are absolutely wonderful. He serves as a point of reference for the audience while also creating extra moments of conflict because of a lack of understanding of vampire society or because he's actively disregarding it. This ties into the fact that having a proactive character rather than a reactive one is always going to be more compelling. Proactive characters look a little different in TTRPGs as the players do always have to be reacting to information they have from the GM, but a measle is an example of what I would consider a proactive character in this kind of setting. There are plenty of examples of him seizing control of a moment or situation. Club Crepuscule in episode 4 immediately springs to mind, with something unexpected yet entirely fitting for his character. Atop this, there's something else that matters about characters and the way they're written that I haven't properly mentioned yet. The relationships characters have with other characters shape them just as much as your goals, intent and purposes do. The way they interact with others informs us who they are, oftentimes more than anything else. A prime example of this is Rainworld's Downpour DLC. The conversations between the iterators, their relationships, that's what makes each of them interesting. I personally love Seven Red Suns more than anything for their relationship to Spearmaster, but also because of the depth of their feelings towards other iterators. They're shown to be close to no significant harassment, as well as their guilt over hurting looks to the moon and having doomed five pebbles by writing out the self-destruction taboo. All of this, these interactions and interpersonal relationships, make Seven Red Suns an engaging character and tell us a lot about them, even without bringing up the iterator's shared goal of the great problem or anything else about the game. Of course, this was also something I asked Condi about, specifically whether or not Soda impacted at all how a measle was written. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, he's like, I, I wrote a, a character document before we started the suckening, and Soda existing was was one of the big big points is like yeah this is like his fucking best friend he's like through thick and thin everything together i had a lot of different ideas for what would happen with soda i'm personally very happy with what did happen with soda none of you know that yet though so you'll 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 see <laughs> but yes i don't think that amizel would have been the same character at all without the inclusion of of soda and i love him he is my little baby boy and charlie played him to perfection in regards to TTRPG specifically, like in the case of Soda, having a GM who understands what you want from NPCs linked to your character and their backstory is vital. Without this understanding, a lot of characterization already established can fall apart because, as mentioned by both myself and now too by Condi, other characters, especially those a character is close to, heavily impact the character themselves. To draw from a campaign one of my partners runs, wherein I play a dragonborn paladin by the name of Cadmus, in our absolutely insane second session, Cadmus kills his own father. This only works so well because in both that session and the prior one, my partner absolutely nails the portrayal of his father. From the abuse he put Cadmus through to the fact that he's only present in the second session to try and kill him. Without that kind of understanding from a DM, the payoff would have fallen far flatter than it did, especially for me as a player. You can see the same thing happening within the Suckening with a Measle and Soda. A lot of credit has to be given to Charlie for his portrayal as Soda, and how it allows a Measle to bounce off him in ways that feel extremely natural. Every scene I watch of these two feels like two teenage best friends who care a hell of a lot about each other, and are dealing with the insane situations of vampire society as best as they can, 
when one of them has suddenly been thrust into it and the other shouldn't even know about it at all. This gives so much more depth to a measle and shows off a facet of his character that we rarely see otherwise, or at the very least not in the same way. It'll be brought up briefly later, but this softer side of a measle only properly shows around Soda. Some of it extends to Shiloh, but to a lesser extent. Without Soda, Emizel would be a much more jaded, closed-off kind of character. In the same vein, I feel Arthur's relationships with Emizel and Shiloh show off a very similar concept very well. Arthur, as a character, is the lone wolf type, being very aloof and showing a lot of annoyance towards both of the boys. As the episodes go on, we start to see moments of him truly caring for them. One of these scenes, where he's teaching Emizel about vampire society and how to hunt for himself, directly parallels a scene happening concurrently with Shiloh and Deacon, where Shiloh is learning about the human world. These scenes divulge a lot about Arthur and Deacon, as well as a lot about Emizel and Shiloh. Arthur focuses on how monstrous being a vampire is, on all the bad aspects of it, showing a lot of how he views himself as well as other vampires. Deacon, who is somewhat of a narrative foil to Arthur, is at peace with his vampirism, and while he certainly doesn't glamorize it, his perspective on unlife is vastly different to Arthur's. Shiloh's characterization during this is exceedingly telling of his character, and continues into later episodes, through the way Bisley portrays him. His very childlike wonder at the world, paired with his horror of learning the truth of it, is phenomenally executed, in a way that doesn't make Shiloh look stupid. It's sometimes played for comedy in the same way that Charlie often uses Grefgor for comedy, but ultimately it's a complex mix of how sheltered Shiloh was and how horrific vampire society is, while keeping Shiloh's actual intelligence intact. All of this information hinges on interactions with other characters. As a writer, it serves as a shining example of how to think about your character's relationships with others. In what way does it shape them? In what ways do these interactions show aspects of your character that couldn't be shown without them? But what makes these characters interesting to watch? What, at the end of it all, makes them compelling? Making compelling characters is both very simple and exceedingly difficult. In theory, a compelling character needs to be nothing more than someone the audience wants to see succeed, often because of their likeable traits or relatable goals. However, this is easier said than done, especially if you are like me and enjoy exploring more morally grey or complex characters whose viewpoints or goals are not always something your audience should be agreeing with. Still, if done right, either of these can result in compelling characters. A lot of how compelling a character is draws from the setting and narrative context around them. An example I can give here is Connor in Detroit Become Human. His root makes you actively work against the other characters you play as. This works incredibly well though, as on most first playthroughs, the player is working to deviate Connor over time, to get him to feel human emotion. All these encounters with tracking down deviants, including the two you play as between Connor's chapters, shape his experiences as more and more he sees that the world is not kind to androids. This slow development, where the player can see the trajectory and where it will end up early into the game but have to work for those results? makes for a compelling arc and a compelling character. When it comes to TTRPGs, however, I truly believe writing compelling characters takes on a different form than other kinds of fiction. As a GM, as I mentioned earlier in the character creation section, it is a battle of balancing making major NPCs interesting without them hijacking the importance the player characters have or stealing their moments away. But as a player, it's a very different story. I asked Condi about this, in terms of a measle. What about him do you think makes him compelling and slash or interesting to watch as a character? And was that something you consciously included or not? Um, <clears throat> oh god. I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> as as a person, I have no fucking clue. I have no fucking clue what, what people like uh, or find compelling or interesting to watch. I just, I just do stuff that I like uh, or find compelling to play. Um, and I, I try to do some different stuff, but it always ends up being kind of the same, like, like base root concept, I guess. Um, I don't know if I will ever, I will ever make something that is, that is compelling or interesting to watch in the same way that, that like Bisley does, because somehow every character he makes is like the community scrunkly. 
Like that is that is their scrunkle right there, and and they need to protect him at all cost. I mean, like look look at Rand, Chip, Shiloh. Oh my God, I, what, what what kind of crack does that guy put in his characters? Because I I don't fucking know, man. I do think that it's it's at least very fun um, having this incredibly cocky and reckless character who also is is almost like encouraged to be reckless and cocky because of, of the nine lives system that he has. Within the space of TTRPGs, this kind of character often thrives over those that are written to be likable, at least in my experience. A big part of the joy of these spaces is letting a player's enjoyment of their own character spread to you. Think of the last TTRPG you played with friends. Even before you began playing, did you excitedly tell each other of the plans you had for your characters? Did your friends' excitement and enthusiasm about their characters make you as excited as they are? Therein lies my point. This is made even more apparent in sessions, where the players throw themselves into their characters. Amiesel's consistent characterization and the clear care Condi puts into portraying him throughout these episodes makes you care arguably far more than if he was written with the intention of being likable to watch. Some of this rings true for other mediums, especially fiction, where the age-old advice of writing what interests you instead of catering to an audience you can't even be sure exists, but in TTRPGs it is exceedingly hard not to abide by this. Amisel is not a character I expected to like as much as I do. By the end of the first episode I was attached, but that did not in any way foreshadow how invested I'd become in his story over the next five episodes. It's not even a contest for me to say that he is outright my favourite player character in all of Just Roll With It. From his characterization to the attention to detail that Condi has with all of his characters showing even more so here. Emisla is the kind of character where only so much of his standout moments rely on successful dice rolls. He's as compelling in the lower stakes moments, especially in his interactions with Soda. To avoid talking about Emisla until I physically can't anymore, I'll summarize it as simply as this. He is, at his core, his most compelling when you can tell Condi is fully in character during any moment and committed to a measles mindset. This doesn't negate the importance of having a thought out character that ties neatly into the world or its plot, but it is what gets the viewer invested to begin with. The same kind of thing can be experienced watching other live play shows, such as Critical Role, Table Story, Legends of Adventurous, Dimension 20, or Transplanner RPG. The infectious joy of the players is a large part of what makes these shows successful, alongside compelling stories and plot lines. I did ask Condi another question in relation to this, and to his portrayal of a measle. Was there any specific scene that you felt was more a measle than any of the others in the show? I think there's there's a few scenes, honestly, that, that kind of like show who he is as a character that we've already seen. Um, and I actually think that the portrayal of his character was was basically done perfectly within the first episode of the show, his little his little solo section there. I, I don't know if I can describe it perfectly right now because my brain is an enigma and I can't even <laughs> describe what goes on in there. Oh, I'm fucking stupid. <laughs> but uh, I think the whole uh a measle biting back at the vampire who is chowing down on him kind of kind of shows what his character is a lot in my opinion no he's not the kind of guy who will let somebody slight him without doing something back and that shows again and again and again in in the series um like he just he doesn't accept defeat like that and he doesn't let somebody fucking backhand him without backhanding them back because you can see that in club crepuscule as well uh, with Edward Twilight when when it was about to catch on fire and he was like, ha, I'm a prince, motherfucker. He's he's just cocky. He's a brat. And I think because of those things, he's also incredibly reckless. Uh, and, and you'll see kind of that recklessness. And I swear some of it isn't always for the bit. Um, I do, like personally, out of character, try to get a measle killed on purpose because of the whole system that's going on there. But I also don't like do anything that I don't think he would not do in character. Condi. On all levels except physical, I am giving you the biggest hug for bringing up the exact scene I, as a viewer, had pinpointed as one of THE Amiesel scenes. That being the one in Club Crepuscule. In the same way Gillian's speech to the Elders is widely remembered, 
this scene instantly embedded itself in my mind as a perfect example of his characterization and where his arc is headed. The scene is engaging because of the showcase of a measles character alongside him being a proactive character within the scene and how it advances the plotline of the show. It accomplishes multiple things from a narrative standpoint at once, which is what most writers strive to achieve with their biggest scenes. To bring in another example of this, I'd like to briefly talk about the first episode of BBC's Merlin, more specifically the climax of the episode. After the narrative establishes tension and stakes in the form of Merlin being a sorcerer in Camelot, uh, where magic is illegal and punishable by death, we reach the first scene in the show where he uses it out in the open. To save Prince Arthur's life, Merlin uses his magic to defend him against a sorcerer who has infiltrated Camelot. What this scene does is establish many things at once. It sets up the status quo of Merlin having to use magic every episode to either save Arthur or all of Camelot, it shows us a way in which he can use his magic without detection, and is the reason he is promoted to Arthur's manservant, which then sets up his and Arthur's dynamic, which is the main focus of the show. Having one scene accomplish more than one thing within the narrative makes what would ordinarily be a good scene into a great one. This is what happens within the Club Crepuscule scene, but also within the scene where a measle is turned. During both, we get more of a sense of him as a character, in terms of his core traits, and advancement of the plot. When a measle is turned, as Condi pointed out, we get the immediate information that a measle is always going to bite back, that he is always going to fight against those who seek to slight him in any way. Of course, this also results in a measle becoming a vampire and introduce some of the conflicts of vampire society in the process, mostly via his sire talking about the repercussions he's going to face for making an unauthorized new vampire. This moment, within the very first episode, is what grabs a viewer's attention for all that it accomplishes and sets up. But what happens after that setup? How do you keep that momentum going and not lose the character amongst it all? Keeping characters consistent is so much easier said than done. For the more complex of a character you've made, the more details you have to keep track of. For TTRPGs, it's a big reason I like to advise people to narrow their character down to a handful of important traits and events to stick to. Once again, looking at the example of my Dragonborn Cadmus to explain this better, despite him being one of my more thought out and complex characters, in the end, he boils down to a few basic principles I stick to when playing him. He's selfless to a self-sacrificial degree, heroic to a fault, a very skilled fighter, friendly towards everyone, and does not reveal much about himself or where he comes from. Keeping those traits in mind when playing him, instead of trying to recall every detail about him at all times, makes it easier to play him and keeps him in character. This also helps if you're trying to pinpoint what core traits are present in media you're consuming. It's how a lot of people, myself included, go about writing fanfiction or deduce information hidden in the subtext of a show. This is, again, something I asked Combi about in regards to a measle. What main values and traits of him did you make sure you stuck to the most? When I was playing a measle, um, uh, there was a few things for sure, and, and I think they're pretty obvious. Reckless and cocky, right? Like, that's that's who he is. Um, he was also power hungry. That was another one. He wanted to, to climb up in the ranks. He wanted a better life for himself. He was also supposed to be, like, much more mean, um, but I don't, like think I have the capacity to be actually like full on mean to somebody <laughs> like I instantly feel feel like a twinge of guilt even if it's just like a fake character being mean to a fake character I, I can't do it um but either way he was still kind of like a jackass uh I did want him to have like you know this hard outer shell but like be soft and caring uh which I think shows a lot with Soda especially but it also shows some with Shiloh uh, especially after the whole queen death scenario. Um, besides that, I've kind of set him up to, to sort of take this position on himself, especially with the nine lives thing, that uh, he's expendable, you know? Um, and, I, and I think he, he looks at that and, and thinks he is expendable because he knows he'll come back. But he's also very short-sighted as a character, so, you know, that's going to come back to bite him eventually. But a measle always bites back, baby. <laughs> Except with the fucking existential concepts like death. <laughs> I don't think you can bite back there. <laughs> First of all, before I talk about this properly, 
Imizel thinks of himself as expendable. Connie, when I catch you, Connie, Connie, when I catch you, Connie, when I catch you, Connie, when I catch you, I'm gonna fucking get you. Like the, like the damn crab image. Me when I fucking get you for this specifically. I expect a direct apology for voicing this out loud within three to five business days. However, this does tie pretty directly into what I was saying before. Condi clearly outlines a handful of core traits that make Amizel who he is. Continually keeping these traits and values in mind when portraying him is what makes him such an interesting, complex character. It makes him feel real. It makes him feel human. Well, vampire, I guess. There's far more complexities to Amizel than just these few traits, like any good character. All his past life experiences, interests, and other details combine into the character we see on screen. Within any scene, keeping core traits of a character in mind, then slowly pulling in other elements is the easiest and most effective way of keeping a character consistent. We do see this a fair amount across the first episode of the campaign. The most prominent and easiest example to point out is Shiloh's solo scene. The slow build from his basic traits and information, like him being locked in his room, his interest in pheasants, etc, to more of the complexities about him, like his relationships with those around him, everything regarding his mother, and so on, it slowly compounds from something more basic into a fully fleshed out character who feels real and alive. Still, this then leads into another question I asked Condi. Was it difficult keeping a character as a measle during tough or high stress situations during the campaign? And did you do anything in particular during these moments to keep you on track? I think for the most part, I didn't struggle too much because every day we would go home after recording and I would listen to a measles playlist and I, I was a measle. And then I, we'd be driving to Charlie's house to record some more and I'd be listening to a measles playlist. I'd be sitting there and be like, good luck. You're fucked. And, uh, you know, just going from there, right? And I never left character because we couldn't leave character because we'd go to the B&B, we'd sleep, we'd wake up, we'd go back and record for another 8 to 12 hours. And and we we were we were these characters. We could never, ever leave character. We were always character, 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 character. We'd go home, we'd talk about character. We'd drive to the house, we'd talk about character. So much character. So, yeah, it was pretty awesome. Uh... <laughs> I think there was a few times where, where I thankfully had like a gap between the session and the next session to think about what I would do or what I wanted to do. Um, and that helps a lot all the time for sure. Uh, but sometimes I wish I didn't have to do that because I feel like the, the stuff you do impulsively or, or through improv as a character uh, tends to align more with what the character would actually do. But there are some situations he gets himself into that I think are very fun and that... Uh, <laughs> Well, let's, let's just say, you know, he, he's very much a fish out of water in those situations. Uh, you'll see when they come. <laughs> but uh, the rest of the campaign is great. That's all I'll say, okay? I look forward to it. You'll notice one of the things Condi mentions here is his playlist for a measle. Music and character playlists are an incredible tool when it comes to writing. I cannot express enough how valuable it is to take the time to gather up songs that put you into the headspace of a character or a story. I know personally sometimes it's more than enough to kickstart me writing a scene I've been putting off or get me into the writing mood. Another thing mentioned here is how much Condi, Bisley, and Grizzly as a whole spoke about their characters between sessions. This is another thing I find very specific to the TTRPG space, that is, to find yourself regularly talking about your characters with others whose characters exist in the same world, often on a weekly basis, and find it incredibly helpful in nailing the portrayal of your characters. A lot of players will poke and prod to get little slices of information about your character, which in turn leads to bettering your own understanding of your character. It's why it's important to have people to talk to about any of your stories, especially in terms of your characters. Given the main topic of this video, I'm gonna talk a bit more about specifics of TTRPGs and characters within them. Compared to most other media, creating a character for a TTRPG is vastly more limited. They have to fit within the setting and within the mechanics of the game. These limits are not necessarily a bad thing. A lot of the most interesting characters and scenes are born from restrictions imposed upon them by the setting or world building. 
D&D specifically, I find most players tend to settle on a base idea that has the class and subclass inbuilt. From my own experiences, well, I'm a forever DM who keeps making paladins anytime I get to play, so the core traits of my characters tend to usually encompass something similar to what I described when talking about Cadmus. Classes in D&D shape characters a lot more than most TTRPGs, in my experience. Games like Lancer or Candela Obscura allow for a lot more flexibility in the character creation process, since you can somewhat mould the roles to fit the character concept you have, while D&Ds tend to be somewhat more rigid. Given this, I once again asked Condi about it, about whether or not Vampire as a System impacted any of a measles creation. That's hard to say, honestly. Um... Huh, I had to think about that. Uh, I don't think so necessarily. Uh, I think I had like a character concept coming into character creation uh, that was pretty pretty well clear to me. Um, it just so happened that that Bruja fit really well for a measle, um, and Ventru just kind of happened to be there uh, as as kind of the twin blood and thing. Uh, which just for reference, he he does have twin blood. He is part Ventru, part Bruja. I don't think that had any real impact mechanically in the game, but that, that is a thing that is on his character sheet. I did end up kind of making like the worst ever character for Vampire the Masquerade because this game is so hyper-focused on social situation and political intrigue, and I was like, what if I made a character who can, who can punch good? <laughs> so uh, there, there's that at the very least. From what Condi said here, and my many hours of madness pouring over the rulebook, I'd put this system into a similar category to the ones I mentioned earlier, with more flexibility. It's still interesting to observe how character creation goes for TTRPGs, especially in cases like this where a character concept fits really well within a system. Now, I was going to end this video here, originally leaving off with my final question to Condi, asking for any extra tidbits or facts. However, well, you'll see. So. I'll pass you back over to Condi again for this bit. I don't really have any, like, writing tidbits, I don't think. Um, I feel like that's uh, stuff like that will just kind of show through the through the series as it comes to its close on episode 13. Character design and name-wise, I did kind of just take the name from a measle from Disgaea 4. Uh, I also managed to take the blonde hair and red eyes and maybe even, like, the scruffle on, on his hoodie. I looked back recently, I was like, wow, I was so very inspired with this character design. I shouldn't be allowed to be in charge of this. <laughs> but for real, I do I do tend to like take inspiration from from games that I've enjoyed in the past. Uh for instance, uh Apotheosis was largely inspired by by Final Fantasy fourteen Shadowbringers. Um I take a lot of uh, character design inspiration from from games like Grand Blue Fantasy, which I think has fantastic character designs. And other, especially JRPGs, I think that with Amiesel especially, I was looking at, um, again, Amiesel from <laughs> Disgaea 4, but I was also looking at uh, The World Ends With You um, and the sort of streetwear that they, they take in those designs as a, as a huge inspiration, because um, that's one of my favorite games of all time. I don't think it shows up in the campaign at all, but uh, in, in the character doc, I do have him written down. He is a smart kid. Like, he's, he's book smart, not money smart. Makes him more intelligent. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, if if the world had dealt him a better hand, then, then maybe he could have had actually a, a good life for himself. Um, and I think he's aware of that, and he's he's bitter, and that's why he does everything he does, really, um, is out of this, this bitterness and almost hatred for the world. And so now we hit a topic I wasn't originally intending to talk about when making this video. Character design. Now... I adore character design. It's one of my favourite aspects of making characters, but I do not think I'm as qualified to talk about it as the actual writing of characters. Still, since Condi's brought it up here, I'd like to talk a little about it. Drawing inspirations from games or other media is something I myself do. For an example, I can share one of the NPCs from my current D&D campaign, Starswept. This is the NPC in question, and here's one of the characters from Honkai Star Rail that I use for design inspiration for them. You can especially see the shoulder armor piece I took pretty directly from Japard, as well as some of the color scheming. I was inspired, 
a lot by the kinds of clothing worn by the characters from Year 06 when drawing Aaron. So much of character design is looking at other media, finding what you like from it, and applying it to your own characters. There are, of course, other things at play when you really get into it. Shape language, silhouettes, etc. But let's take a look at some examples of excellent character design from some of my favourite media. Firstly, Spiritfarer. All of the character designs in this have incredible shape language, and fit beautifully into the world of the game. Stella and Daffodil as the two main characters stand out wonderfully against everything, especially Stella with her star-shaped hat. This is something even the developers themselves mention wanting to achieve within their earlier designs and concept art of Stella. And all of the spirits stand out just as well, and I genuinely cannot think of a design that I dislike. This design bleeds into all aspects of their game too. From looking through the digital art book, you can see mention of things like Beverly's house having areas only small enough for her, the way they colour match themes of buildings to characters, or even the thought processes behind the functionality of everything that appears in the spirits' houses. The character writing ties into all this too, like how Hades appears because of how Stella views death, or the individual spirit flowers receive when you bring each spirit to the Evador. This kind of thing we see in the seconding characters too, like Amiesel's more streetwear look because of his involvement in the demons, Arthur's fancier clothing reflecting somewhat the era he comes from alongside his need to keep up appearances, and Shailu's pristine appearance reflecting what's expected of a prince and what has been drawn into him from a young age. Now I'd like you to turn your attention to Slug Terror. This is another example of incredible character design, as well as having its world-building tie into designs. Eli, for instance, has a distinctive colour scheme that not only encompasses his clothing, but his mecha too. And before donning these clothes, he's often cited as out of place because his clothing is from the surface. The rest of the Shane gang also have their own distinctive colours, while having some amount of Eli's too, tying their designs neatly together. Looking at any group shot of the four of them, they look like they belong together, because they're designed spectacularly to be that way. This kind of design extends to the slugs too, with even their protoforms, that being their regular appearance without having hit velocity, reflecting the kind of velocimorph, being the transformation they undertake when shot from a blaster and hitting velocity, they'll have. Just by looking at each of these slugs, you can take a pretty solid guess at what abilities they'll possess in combat. Of course, there's some exceptions to this, but it rings true for most slugs. The final one I'd like to touch on is How to Train Your Dragon. Though the designs for the actual main characters of this franchise are phenomenal, I'm going to focus more on the dragons in regards to this. Across the TV shows, games, and movies, there's a large roster of dragons with differing designs. While a couple of these fall somewhat flat, I'm looking at you, Light Fury, and don't think you can escape me either, Nine Realms. Most of them are incredibly well executed. Each dragon is unique, with its own attack patterns or abilities, offering something fresh and interesting whenever one is introduced. When watching Race to the Edge for the first time, I didn't expect something like the Death Song, luring in dragons with its call, capturing them, and then eating them. Yet, it fits really well within all of the world building we've gotten from this series up to this point. Not feeling out of place, and the design for this dragon... God, just look at it, it's gorgeous. The use of bright coloration like a poisonous animal immediately says a lot about the dragon without even bringing up any of its abilities. My point with all of this is that character writing informs a lot of character design. Sometimes, of course, a design can be the direct opposite of what the character is, and this is just as fun, but the writing still informs how they're designed. The two are intrinsically linked. What Condi said about his character design for a measles says a lot in this regard, like I pointed out earlier. This of course all ties back to the phenomenal character writing within the Suckening. This extends to the NPCs as well as the player characters. The portrayals of all the characters are so beyond perfect, I can't even properly put it into words. A measles I especially see this in, and it's a big reason he's become my favourite character across all Just Roll With It campaigns and one of my favourite characters in fiction in general. Strong, consistent characterization that shines across all aspects of the show is also a big reason the campaign is as good as it is, 
of course, alongside Charlie's knack for incredible storytelling and Nathan Hanover's banger soundtrack. The Suckening is a master in all that it does. But that's about all I have to say about character writing. I'm just going to leave us off with this from Condi. A uh, fun, fun little last little tidbit. I don't really have much for this section. I'm sorry. Maybe I do. I don't know. I've been kind of rambling. Um, but this is just kind of funny. When I was writing the the backstory for a measle, uh, I did it on my phone and Google Documents. And when I <laughs> when I put in a measle backstory in the title, it autocorrected to Eminem backstory. So Eminem has a fucking crazy backstory, dude. He's a vampire now. Hi. I've got a little segment at the end of cut clips from Condi and of me fumbling over my words, but before that I'd like to just quickly thank everyone involved in this video. Of course, a big thank you to Condi for being incredibly cool and taking the time to record the answers to the questions that I had. Uh, I'd also like to thank Whimsy for the talk sprites for Condi for this video, Pond underscore for the art of Bisley, and Zuzby for the art of Grizzly. Links to them are down in the description, please go and support them. Finally, I'm Ethan and I use any slash all pronouns. If you're interested in any of what I do, my art, writing, or videos like this, there's a link to my Twitter where I'm most active. A big thank you to you for watching. Now, enjoy some of the art takes. This is what I get for recording the day after I went to KaiCon. Um, <laughs> I did not read that well. Oh my god. Kill me. Okay. Now, I can't speak for any of Grizzly's writing process because his Twitter DMs are off and he is living. Unbother the moi. Unbo the moi. Wow. I'm so good at English. I'm. You can see the same thing happening within the suckering. Suckering? <laughs> suckering! <laughs> oh my god, okay. Charlie, this is what happens when you name your campaign fucking suckening. And how it ame- How it amazles? Yeah, that's- that's English. In theory, a compelling character needs to be nothing more than someone the audience wants to- Audient. <laughs> Audient. Okay. A lot of how comparing- Comparing. <laughs> I can't speak, dude. A measles consistent characterization and the clear condi the clear condi the clear condi <laughs> me when condi is see-through <laughs> also every time i look down emotional support fire star keychain he's here looking at me encouraging me to keep going i'm so close <laughs> i got this <laughs> sunning rocks belong to river clan by the way <laughs> Um, it's very like Puss in Boots like, except uh, we recorded Suckening before that movie came out, so I did it first. Haha, <laughs> fuck you, Pixar. <laughs> I don't think that's Pixar. Shit. Fuck, it's it's DreamWorks. Shit. <laughs> God damn it. So hopefully that was all good, Ethan. Um, I'm assuming your name is Ethan, right? I, that's just like in your. Unless like that's Ethan the Anus, like like Unis Anus. Oh no. Hey, remember that novel I mentioned? Well, since you made it to the end, here's a little sneak peek at it. Psst, this is subject to change in the future. Enjoy. He is born, as all changelings are, blind and limbless, a formless, ugly thing, made up of writhing pale skin that's translucent enough to see each and every vein as he twists between forms and faces. Gender and identity lose all meaning before one can even form coherent thought when they emerge into the world like this, and he is no less unremarkable, no less horrifically violent in the way his bones snap and reshape beneath supple skin and fresh limbs. No. What makes Nowhere Golden Storm so different from other changelings is not his form, not his birth, not even his environment or some superstitious thing like the phase of the moon. It is his eyes, piercing golden when they should be filmy and pale, still fogged over, as all newborns are until their third day of life, but undeniably golden. 
Just five months into his life, Celastos' protectors, the circle of the webwing, come to whisk him away, uttering in hushed whispers to his parents. They speak of prophecy, of signs from gods. His older sibling, only three years his senior, cowers in the doorway, their wide eyes taking in the proceedings. Nowhere's parents, two perfectly normal changelings by the names of Mirage and Liminals, respectively. Sign his life over without fuss. With one action, Nowhere Goldenstorm's life is no longer his own, given to a cause far greater than himself. Nowhere is eight years old when he first questions this notion. Uh, bye-bye.